you too. Hallelujah. He'll let you know he's heard your prayers. He'll let you know that he's working on things that you've been praying about. God is, oh, hallelujah. He's a faithful God to hear and answer prayer. Hallelujah. Let's see if anybody's got a prayer request tonight. Is there anybody here that wants us to pray for anything? Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. I'd like for you to remember my brother and sisters and um, Michael's brothers and sisters. While we're <clears throat> talking about Brother Michael, if you'll notice down here at the bottom of the altar, there's a something there. Michael's sister Rhonda and her family had that made for our church. It says, in honor of Michael O'Greer, for his servant's heart, along with the Lord's vision to establish this house of worship, Island City Refuge Church of God. Then it says Matthew 5, 14 through 16. And that is where it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Just want you to, uh, I want you to see that. We're going to put it up on a wall. Um, it took me a while to be able to do this. I don't know why. I just felt so tenderhearted about it. I couldn't handle it right then. But I'm, I'm to the place I feel like I can do this now. And uh, to me, it's a beautiful memorial for Brother Michael. And a actually, we would have never had this church if it hadn't been for the Lord showing him to begin with. Right. He, he was only saved for a few weeks. And the Lord showed him we were going to have church in our house. And uh, he showed him before he ever showed me. And then I didn't know because Michael was so young in the Lord. I didn't know if that was true. And then the Lord confirmed it to me. So I am really thankful for uh, my husband starting this church. It's been a blessing for many years. Uh, we were still small as far as uh, our regular congreg congregation. We're real small, but... Uh, the Lord is using us with other people around and about in the whole world. <laughs> so, though, and that's really the way the whole church has been for the long, a long time. We um, we had a, had a small church service, but we would minister to many, minister in nursing homes and jail and and jails. Brother Michael ministered to the men and I ministered to the women and, and uh, we went to the nursing homes. We uh, worked in the um, uh, feeding the homeless. They did that for many years and we had, went off and on and did that. So we've done lots of ministry and, out, and re reached out to people from our church but uh, and now it's just more this morning. So I just want to say thank you, Rhonda and Clayton and Emma and all of Papa's other grandchildren. He loves those grandchildren, Maggie and Clayton and Hayden and Landon, and all of y'all for, for being so kind as to have this sign made for us. I know it might seem like a long time since you sent it, if you, if you watch this, but uh, it just took me a while to be able to put it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, and um, my husband's, I don't like to think of just his memory. <laughs> I like to think of him as a lover, and it's just taken me a while to get to be uh, accepting of this. So, anyhow, is there anybody else that has a prayer request tonight? Nehemiah. For Bill. Let's pray for Bill. He needs prayer. Okay. Hallelujah. There's several that's going to be traveling this week. I know uh, Sister Tammy and Lee and the girls and Sister Rita and uh, Stephen. So please remember all of them. Pray that God will give them traveling mercies. And uh, somebody else got a prayer request, Brother Don. Remember my healing of my hand. Mm -hmm. Also remember my work um, and that everything will go well with that. Uh, remember the people I worked with before, uh, that the Lord would help them and bless them. Um, my friend Chris Vano is still searching for, so pray for him. Um, it's just, just a lot.
lot of people affected by all this and not in good ways. And so just need the Lord help help us. Help Olivia and Brian. Okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, I saw her name pronounced, it was Lily, Lily Reap on the Facebook, and her husband is in the hospital with COVID, and uh, he's 77 years old, so please pray for him, that God will help him to come through this. They've been married a long time, and she needs him, and I know just how that feels. So if y'all remember her and him, his name is Bill. Anybody else got him? Brother Ben, anybody else got a request? <coughs> Jesus. Okay, let's go to prayer. We'll remember all your requests out there. You think of the request that you have, and we will call out that the Lord will hear and answer your prayers. Okay? Let's pray. Glory to your name, dear Father, we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your kindness to us all along the way. You have been so kind, Lord. God, we love and appreciate you. Thank you, Lord. Michael, Lord, thank you for giving, helping us to know that you want us to start this church. Oh, God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my gifts. Be true to you all the way to the end, God. Thank you so much. Be true to us all the way to the end, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, I praise you. Thank you, Father. I ask you, Lord, dear brother. God's hand to heal. And Lord, remember all of those that are going to be traveling, Lord. Ask you to give them traveling mercies. Keep them safe, Father. In the name of Jesus, keep them safe. Lord, we pray that you ask you to keep Sister Rita and Brother Stephen safe. Keep Sister Lee and all the children. Sister Tammy safe. God, keep us all safe. As we go about our business, so we're working for you and doing the things you want to do. Doing God we pray for the jail. Oh God, thank you for your yeah, brother God's work. Remember Chris Bay, he needs a good job, a good job.
Yes, thank you to all the musicians. Really helps with my message because it kind of leads right into what I want to talk about tonight. Have you ever heard the saying that practice makes perfect? Mm. Right? We've all heard that yes, one. Man. Right. Doing things really well requires practice. You're Laney on the trumpet and Bill on the bass at the end there and there's significant talent there. There's God-given talent there, but it doesn't come out, and it's not repeatable without practice. Since we started this <clears throat> music ministry with Turner Family Band, I can hear the progression. If you go back and listen to the very beginning, there's a great increase in the mastery of what they're doing. The harmonies are better. The tone is better. It's improving because we're practicing. Every day we're practicing with another song. We're practicing with another capability. Uh, Laney and Loria are both doing an online trumpet lesson with a gentleman that we met through the ministry. And, um, and they have to practice. I mean, that's part of the responsibility of doing and lessening. If, <clears throat> if you were ever uh, wanting to try out for something, uh, whether it was a drama in school, I think Lori is uh, for a part, or singing part in her choir thing at school, or, or the drama thing that they do, you have to try out for the part. But in order to be successful at that, you have to practice it. When, when I do a a big presentation to to a customer for a sales uh, opportunity. I have to practice what I'm going to say. I have to practice how I'm going to respond to what he might say or she might say. It's all not fully rehearsed, right? But I get better and I get more confident at doing when I have practiced it. We talked this morning in Sunday school about the, the prodigal son and how... <clears throat> Before he went to his father, he said to himself, well, here's what I'm going to do. And he practiced what he was going to say to his father when he saw him. Before he actually went to see his father. Right. Because he wanted to get it right. He wanted to get it right. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, if you're present, you may stay seated. I'm going to read quite a bit. <clears throat> the Lord will help my throat here. So, verse uh, chapter four in Ephesians, verse seventeen. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Thank you, Sister Lee. To being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, 
which is corrupt according to this deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one to another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that steal, stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. 5 and 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Sister Linda, we pray for the message. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. We thank you for all the wonderful advice that you give us to be able to live in this world as a Christian. We ask you to help Brother Don to teach us and preach to us tonight. Lord, just what you want him to. And we count on you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Practice. Practice, practice, practice. Does it say, it says, practice, 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 Carnegie Hall. And when you get really, really good at something, you can go and play at Carnegie Hall. I never played at Carnegie Hall. I guess I didn't practice enough. So in Ephesians, Paul is telling the people of Ephesus over and over, these are the things you've got to do. These are the things you need to stay away from. These are the things you need to practice. Practice. I'm going to talk about four things we're going to practice. I'm... I like to go golf. I like golf history. And there was a story that, that went around about Ben Hogan, the golfer. And after he won a tournament, and, and somebody, a reporter, asked him about how he could withstand the pressure of the tournament and still hit those incredible shots that he did and perform so well under pressure. And, and, and Mr. Hogan just said, well, I guess I was just lucky. And the reporter said, but... Mr. Hogan, you practice more than any other golfer that ever lived. And Ben Hogan replied, he said, Well, the more I practice, the luckier I get. The more you practice, the luckier you get. What he was saying was that the practice was really what made him be able to be proficient at doing what he was doing. It wasn't based on luck. Right? It was the fact that he was practicing more than everybody else that made him successful. And what I want to do is, I want us to practice for perfection. I want us to practice so that we become perfect in Christ for ourselves. And as the scripture in Ephesians said, and so that other people will see that perfection in us and want it for themselves. That's what this is about. That's why we practice. We practice the trumpet or the bass so that we get better. So that people like to hear what we have to say. So maybe they want to take up and play the trumpet. And then they'll take lessons and they'll practice. And it's the same thing with our faith. We have to be able to take that, practice it, to the point where we get better at it. So I want to take that thought and turn it. And turn from just chance or natural talent and ability and turn it into faithfulness. We got a little. Lori and I have started doing crafts for my sermons. This is my self invented. I call it the faithometer, or whether it was incorrect to me, it's pathometer. <laughs> you see that all right, Jose? I have to hold it, I think. Pathometer? Faithometer? 
the more you practice, I'll do it this way, the more you practice your faithfulness, the higher it goes. Right? So you start down here and you go, Lord, I trust you with it. Lord, I know you can help me with it. Lord, I trust you with all of it. Lord, I can't do it. You can do it. I have faith that you're going to do it. And when you get all the way over it, my lawyer, he said, thank you, Lord, for doing it. Right? Even if he hasn't done it yet. Doesn't matter. Right. How faithful are you? Where are you on the faith armor? Where is your level? And, and if you're going to go from the red to the yellow to the green, what do you have to do to get it better? You have to practice. You have to practice. And does it change? Does the level of your faith change from week to week, month to month, year to year? Certainly. Ideally, it's going from red to yellow to green. That's where the Lord wants it to go. That's where you should want it to go. How faithful are you to Him? Not necessarily to each other, but that's important too. If we're not faithful to each other, we can't be faithful to the Lord. It's just a natural thing. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody. or, or I'm just trying to see if we can create sort of a, a, a self-evaluation. Look on this dial and, and just pick a point where you think you are. Where are you with your own? You don't have to tell anybody. But where are you with your self-evaluation of your faithfulness to God? Where are you? And if you're not where you think you want to be or need to be, what do you need to do to get there? One of it is practice. I think we all realize that to get better or more efficient, I'm going to take this down, <clears throat> at something, ouch, I'm just going to let it go. Um, you need to practice it. And then, when you think you've gotten better at it, what do you do? You practice some more. Mm -hmm. You don't stop. There's always room for improvement. <clears throat> Thank you. I need to patent that. Um, <laughs> people on the help Facebook are going to steal my idea about faith on me. <laughs> they can have it Lord we'll you can know. have it we'll but, but mastery of a skill is not something that's immediate mastery of a skill is a process it's a process we start at one point and then we gradually improve and get better it takes dedication practice is hard Laney is practice hard Gloria is practice hard when you do it? Yes. Right? It takes your time. It's an effort. It's something that's needing to be done. But it gets in the way. It's, it's a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice what you want to do instead of practicing in order to make the time and create the effort to practice. It means giving up things that you'd like to be doing other than practicing. But God wants us and He needs us to practice certain godly skills. And not for our own benefit, it is for our own benefit, but He wants us to master it. Why? Because He wants us to go out and show it to other people. And you don't want to go out and perform in public if you haven't practiced. Right? You don't want to go out there just, oh, I'm just going to do this. I've never done it before, but, well, we'll give it a try. And that's not what the Lord wants from us. He wants us to be able to do it well because we've practiced it. And being faithful to God means being able to sacrifice and bury all of your self-wants. Keeping His commandments even when nobody else is watching. That's being faithful to God. Thinking about Him when you're just 
contemplating things, where you're not really involved in anything. But instead of involving your mind around all the other things in your life, you're going to focus it on Him and His needs. What He needs you to do for Him. And, and think about those, how wonderful He is to us, how merciful He is to us, how loving He is to us. Think about those things. When, when we practice our faithfulness, a couple of things are going to result. First, like with any practice, if you, if you practice it, you'll get better. That's what we want. I mean, that's, that's why we practice, is to get better. The, the other outcome is that others around us will witness that faithfulness. They'll see what we're doing. We'll, they'll see when you're consistent with God. It gets noticed. And it can make a great difference to someone that's in a struggle. That's struggling to be consistent with God. They're like, well, if they can do it, I certainly can do it. I probably have to practice that. Show them through your actions how to practice faithfulness. Faithfulness to God. The second one I want to talk about is prayer. The more we practice prayer, the more it becomes a normal part of our life. Not a special occasion. Not a one-time event because I'm in trouble. Or someone else is in trouble. A normal part of life. Some of us, probably most of us, pray before our meals. That's good. But it has to be more than that. You pray when you're sick. You pray when a loved one or a friend is sick. You pray um, for, for a circumstance to be resolved. A relationship to be healed. We all do that. But those are occasional prayers. Right? They're not all the time prayers. We, we take up our prayer requests every service and it's for certain occasional things. And that's, that's, it, that's critical. It's important. God says, if you have, you have not because you ask not, right? We, we need to be making our petitions to Him. But what he really wants us to do is practice where prayer becomes so much more than all of that. So much more than just the occasional circumstance or situation. It's alright to ask the Father for help or to heal or to fix or to restore or whatever the case is. That's fine. But putting prayer as a key part of our existence is what God wants. So instead of occasional prayer, God wants perpetual prayer. Praying without ceasing, the Bible says. Continual, ever living to make intercession. Does that sound like Jesus is taking some time off from praying? No. Because he's seeing everybody all the time, everywhere. He's praying all the time. Right? And that's what God wants from us. Now, Brother Don, how do I pray all the time? I've got things to do. Right. We have to practice it. We have to put it into motion. It's, it's hard. How do we, and, and how many of us are really in that sort of, that state of ultimate, constant prayer? Right? It's a, it's a very high goal. But that's where God wants us to be. That's what he said in his word. We're too busy most of the time. We've got things going on. How, how do we take time and carve out time for that? It sounds like practice, right? How do I carve time out of my schedule for practice? Well, we need to come up with a plan. We need to create a schedule. We need to say, you know, in this time frame to start with, and then that time frame gets wider, and then it gets more frequent until eventually it fills up your calendar. It's amazing to see the things that God will do if we come earnestly and frequently to Him in prayer. 
Remember, prayer is communicating. It's communing with God. It doesn't have to be always request-based. Do this for me. Do that for him. Do that for her. It's a conversation. If you have a close friend, you don't just call them and just talk about this thing or that thing. Or You talk about everything. Right? You, you, you don't limit your conversation to just specific events. You ask them about how their things are going. You ask them, and it's not just about asking them for things. Right? When you're talking to your friend, you just don't say, what are you going to do for me with this? And what are you going to do for me with that? And No, it's, it's, it's a conversation. And that's what God wants from us. You're communicating. You're creating a natural language between yourself and God. And that's what God wants from us. He wants to abide with us. He wants to be with us. He wants to talk with us. Maybe you think, well, God never talks to me. It's like, you're too busy asking him for stuff. You're not really talking to him. You have to practice that. Set the time aside. Dedicate yourself to it. It, it doesn't have to be strenuous or difficult or it can be very quick. I talked uh, a few months ago about flash prayers where when I was on a plane and I'd just be walking to my seat in the back of the plane, I would go by and I would see people and I would pray for them just real quick as I'm walking down the aisle. Right? It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be... It's a communication. It's an ongoing conversation. It, it is no different than talking to a friend. No different whatsoever. We didn't sing it tonight, but just have a little talk with Jesus. We oh, we did sing that? Was it? Wow, I didn't even hear that. Sorry. Tell him about your troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. It's not difficult. It's not hard to do. You talk to your friends all the time. Is God your friend? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. We just have to practice it. We have to make it a routine. We have to make it better. And I think if you're faithful to God and you're in a conversational relationship with God or have through prayer, then the more you feel or practice feeling God in your daily life, the more of God's presence you feel in your daily life. So we need to practice feeling God at work in our life. Do you, do you sometimes feel like you're just self-guided? I mean that, you know, I decided to go to the store and I decided to go here and I decided to go there. And sometimes it is in our minds that we decided it, but then sometimes God interacts with us and real, makes us realize after the fact that, you know, I didn't really go there because I wanted to go there. I went there because God needed me to do something over there. And he put it in me. He conversed with me that that's what he needed me to do. I thought it was all my idea until I realized he unfolded to me it wasn't all my idea. It wasn't self-directed. God has places for us to go. He has needs for us to do. And He wants us, and He wants to go with you to those places. He wants you to go with you on those adventures. He wants to be with you. Have you ever felt just all alone? Like, like there's something missing, like you're dealing with some crazy circumstance or, or situation, and you just feel like you're all alone in it, like there's nothing that anyone can do to help me to get out, what do we call it, the mully grubs, and get, what do I do? I, I'm so alone. But, but we don't 
don't have to be alone. We don't have to be alone. God can come and comfort you. He can come and calm you. He can ease your stress about it. And the reason is because God is what they say is omnipresent. What that means is that he's wildly, widely, or constantly encountered. That's what that means. I looked it up. Widely or constantly encountered. Common or widespread. What it means is he is present everywhere at the same time. Now, you and I can't be everywhere at the same time. We've tried that. I know all of us have tried that. I can't be here and there and here at the same time. He can. He's different. He's God. He's omnipresent. He can be there for you and for me Hallelujah. and for her yes. and for him he can. wherever we are Amen. all at the same time. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being that place. But he's only there if we feel it. If we feel his presence. Have you ever been in a dark room or a dark place? Maybe it was on a street or just a room. And you thought you were alone. But it turns out that there was really somebody else there that you didn't know because they didn't say anything. Sometimes it scares you. I get it. God's not going to scare you like that. But did you... Did you Sometimes you sort of feel like there's somebody else out there, right? Or somebody else in that room. But, but you didn't really sense or feel. Sometimes you could be in that room and you think you're all alone and you don't really feel the other person's presence with you. Was it because they were so quiet or... Was it really because you weren't looking? You weren't anticipating someone else being there? God wants us to feel Him as if we go, as, as we go through our day all the time. He wants us to be looking for Him. To be anticipating that He's in that room with you in the dark or in the light. We need to practice feeling the presence of God every day, wherever we are. And it can help us greatly to know that we're not alone in our situation. Amen. Right? We're not alone in the dark. In the dark places that we end up in. We're not alone. The more we seek that presence, the more often we'll find it. That constant presence that God can offer. Again, He's omnipresent. He's widely or constantly encountered. That is reassuring to our soul. The more we practice feeling the presence of God, the more present He feels. Every day, every situation, He's a constant companion Hallelujah, if you'll Father. let him be. Glory to God. Right. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. We need to practice feeling his presence. Hallelujah, This uh this last one. The last one is the other ones have been kind of inward, right? Our faithfulness, our prayer life. Right, our feeling God's presence. Right, they're kind of self-directed, self-directed improvement. The next one and the last one is more outward. The more you practice Christianity, or the more you practice being Christ-like, the more your life expresses God to other people. Are you are you a full-time Christian? If God was watching, and He is, because He's omnipresent, right? right? Yes. He's always watching. If He was watching you all the time, would He be pleased with what He sees? Even when you're alone in the dark room? 
He's watching. Would he be proud? He was proud of Jesus. Right? Matthew 3 and 17 says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because Jesus was faithful to him. Jesus had a constant life of prayer. Jesus felt his Father all the time. The same traits that I'm asking you for, Jesus was the, the blueprint for. He's the one, he's the practice book, if you will. That's what we want to practice, is our life of Christianity. Now, there, there are times when our ability to act in a Christ-like or a Christian manner can be strained or tried. That's what the devil wants to do, right? He wants to knock you off of that Christ-like demeanor and make you do something that's not very Christ-like. Something that God would not be pleased and proud of. Right. And unfortunately for us, he's very good at it. He's very good at trying to knock us down in that area. And so good that sometimes it gets us to a point where we do make bad choices. We do make bad decisions. We do act wrongly toward others. So how do we get this to happen less frequently? How do we get better at being Christ-like? You got it. Practice. If you practice being Christ-like, then it'll come naturally. And even if the devil comes, you'll recognize it for what it is. It's not... It's not this happening. This is the devil making me want to do something I shouldn't be doing. It is not righteous in God's eyes. The more we practice Christian behavior, the more it becomes natural, flowing. The more it becomes a good habit. And then in that acts as an internal defense against the devil and his tricks. As we practice the good, then the bad has no place to roost in our hearts. Practice makes it easier and easier to master. It makes it easier, it makes it more routine, right? When we practice Christianity, we express the image and the attitudes of God and other people see it. They notice it. They desire it for themselves. Some of them do. They look at you and they go, well, nothing ever rattles Sister Lee. Well, everybody in the, everybody in the, in a, church, an arousing laughter from the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing, nothing ever seems to bother her or I want to be like Brother Jose because he's always faithful to God and wanting to be a witness to other people. But what I'm getting at is you don't do that overnight, right? That's a practice thing that you get better at by doing it. It's practice. You may not have tagged it as that, but that's what it is. And the goal is to get it for yourself, but it's got to shine out. It's got to reflect out. It's got to make its way into other people's hearts that they desire it and want it and want to practice it for themselves. So, so is all this practice really necessary? I really has to. Lori asked me that the other day. I really have to practice my trumpet. Cornet. Cornet. Excuse me. I said, only if you want to improve. Only if you want to get better. If you don't want to get any better, you don't have to practice a bit. What are, we, what are we trying to prove? What are we trying to improve? Ourselves. Us. Right. Or more importantly, Him in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And what's the result of all this practice? 
your life becomes easier here. But more importantly, life is translated from a limited life to an eternal life. Because if you're not following and practicing these things, you're not going to have an eternal life. You're not going to be in the fold of God. One of His sheep. There's one final reason to practice these things. It improves yourself and it, and it improves the people around you. But most importantly, I want to say this. Practice for your family. Practice for your family. Set the example of godly living that will help them. Show them a life of real faithfulness. A life filled with constant and consistent prayer or communing with God. Show them how to feel God in their life. All the time. Anywhere they are. Even in a far country. Show them Christianity in all of its glory. All of the benefits of living a Christ-like life. God gives us the things that He wants us to be good at doing. God gives us these talents and abilities. And He gives them to us so that we get better at them. But we get better at them because we practice them. We have to make them a priority. We have to set aside the time. We have to dedicate ourselves to them. And not just for yourself, but for others, including your family. One more scripture. Turn to Genesis 35. Genesis chapter 35. This is when Jacob returns to Bethel. And God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, his family, and to all that were with him, which is all the people around and his servants and whatnot, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar to God, unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and went with me in the way which I went. Does it sound like Jacob was living this type of constant element? Was he practicing these things that we talked about? Yeah. And what did he want? He wanted his family and the people around him to embrace those things as well. And what he wanted to show them was the result. Who answered me unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. Jacob went a lot of places. Jacob went to a lot of places. Jacob was in a lot of situations. And God was with him wherever he went. That's what we want. Jacob told them what they needed to do. He told them what they needed to get rid of. Get rid of the idols. Purify yourselves. Then come, let us go. Let us worship the one who helped me, who has always been with me. Is Jacob talking to us tonight? He's talking to me. He's saying, practice, practice, practice. 
we don't get better unless we are willing to do. And what was Jacob going to do when he got there? He was going to do what? He was going to build an altar to God. What's an altar used for? Sacrifice. So build yourself an altar. Sacrifice yourself. Sacrifice your self-directedness, your self-will, your self-pride. All of those things that are keeping you from the God that wants to live with you and be omnipresent with you. Sacrifice. Build an altar. And the God of Jacob will come and be with you. Have that life of real faithfulness. That life filled with that prayer that you need. That communion with God. Lord, we just ask for your help to show us. Lord, your word points us in the direction but Lord, we need to build that altar. We need to put on that altar all the things, all the, 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 the sin, and we're going to put on the confusion. We're going to put the sickness down there. We're going to put the relationships with other people down there. We're going to put all these desires and things that are pulling us away from you and leading us off into a far country and we're going to put them on this altar and sacrifice them there. Because we want to practice being faithful to you. We want to practice a life of Christian goodness and kindness. And it's to our benefit but it's also to the benefit of those around us and our families. Lord, we know that you are always present to help us, even in the darkest times. Lord, we know that you love us, that you care about us, and that you will help us. Amen.